I would like to begin by congratulating Shane Bauer, Josh Vital, and Sarah Shord on the release of their poignant memoir, A Sliver of Light, Three Americans Imprisoned in Iran. Their story begins on a warm summer day in July of 2009. The three friends who met as students at Cal Berkeley decided to go for a hike in the mountains of Iraq. Shane and Sarah were living together in Syria, teaching and writing, and Josh was visiting from the US. Sarah shared recently on CBS Morning Edition that there are very few moments in life where everything changes forever. And this was one of those moments. This hike was one of those moments. Their capture was the beginning of a 26 month long experience of living in captivity. Sarah, Shane, and Josh were cut off from the world and from everything that they knew, including one another. After more than a year in solitary confinement, Sarah was freed in September 2010. Just one year later, almost to the day, Shane and Josh were freed and released, and they began the process of healing, which you'll hear more about tonight. Today, Shane and Sarah, who are married, have both found work focusing on prisoners' rights in the US and around the world. Shane is an investigative journalist and a recipient of the Guggenheim Award for Criminal Justice Reporting. Sarah is a writer, educator, and contributing editor at Solitary Watch. Her work as an advocate for prisoners' rights has been featured in the New York Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, and CNN. Josh is a historian with a background in environmental sustainability. He is a doctoral candidate at the New York State University and a new dad. At the end of tonight's program, there will be a time to ask questions. Um, we will go ahead and have a microphone right there in the center. Please make sure that you are asking a question. We know that there are so many great statements to share tonight, but we want to keep this concise, so questions only, please. Um, the show is being recorded, so just to be aware of the lighting in the room. Um, and at the end of the night, we will go into the book signing. We'll have the book signing located at the table over there in the back, and we'll have additional books for sale here as well. Thanks so much, and please join me in welcoming Shane Bauer, Josh Vital, and Sarah Shord to Six and I. Thank you. So I'm just going to kind of tell a few stories. I'm not going to try to tell our whole story. Uh, and I'm going to start with a story that a lot of you probably want to hear, uh, which are wondering about, which is how this, how this happened. Um, Sarah and I were living in Damascus, we were living in Syria, uh, working, um, and Josh was traveling, uh, teaching um, in different countries around the world, um, and another friend uh, was, was in Europe, and Josh and our other friend Sean McFessel came to visit us uh, in Damascus, and we decided to, to take a trip, and um, we chose Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, I had worked in Baghdad before as a journalist, and which is, was a war zone in 2009, um, and Iraqi Kurdistan was not. And it really never had been throughout the war. Uh, it's, Iraqi Kurdistan is an autonomous region within Iraq. Um, no American had ever been uh, killed or kidnapped there. Um, it has a tourist industry. About two, mi two million people uh, visit Iraqi Kurdistan every year. And uh, in 2011, it was on the New York Times uh, top 41 places to visit in the world. Uh, we went there, and uh, you know we were just there for a few days, really. We, we visited uh, some castles and went to some museums, and we wanted to get out of the city, so uh, we asked people where we could go, and our hotel manager and a taxi driver told us the same place, uh, this place called Ahmedawa, where there was a waterfall. Um, it wasn't a big waterfall, but uh, you know there's not a lot of waterfalls in that region, and so it was kind of an attraction, and there were hundreds of people there, uh, Kurdish families camped out, and we went there and, you know, we asked if there was a, a trail to hike on and there was. And someone pointed us to it and we, we slept near the bottom of the trail. In the morning we hiked for quite a long time, for about five hours. And we, when we got near the top of this kind of mountain, we stopped and had lunch. And then uh, we're kind of deciding whether to keep going or turn back. And we thought, let's just get the ridge is right there, let's just go up there, see you see what there is to see, and then come back. And as we start walking, we saw a couple soldiers, and they waved us to them. And when we got to them, we saw that they were Iranian. And we, we didn't know that we were close to the Iranian border. Um, and so we were, we were really shocked, and asked us for our passports, and found out we were American, and then, you know, 
took us into to the next town. We managed to call our friend Sean, who wasn't with us, who called the U.S. Embassy, and it went from there. Um, for a few days, we were driven around Western Iran, and we didn't know what was going to happen. We thought we were going to be taken back to Iraq relatively soon, um, and uh, we we were taken into one city, and we were in an apartment building. We were interrogated, uh, and then at nighttime, we were put in a car and driven out of the town into the countryside. So I'm going to read a little passage from that time. We're leaving the, the city. He's got a gun, Josh says, startled but calm. He just put it on the dash. In a busy roundabout, our car swerves to avoid an oncoming vehicle. The pistol falls from the dash and scuds across the floor. My heart stops and my mouth goes dry. The pudgy man picks it up and sets it on his lap. We turn onto a road that leads out of town. The city lights fade behind us. Where are we going? Sarah asks in a disarming, honey-sweet voice. Sss, the pudgy man hisses turning around to face us and putting his finger to his lips. The headlights of the car trailing us light up his face, revealing his cold, bored eyes. He turns back to face the front. The solitary lights of the country houses stream by like little meteorites. The car falls silent again. He picks up the gun in his right hand and cocks it three times. Sarah's eyes widen. Her posture stiffens. She leans toward the man in front and with a note of desperation says, Ahmadinejad, good. Obama, bad. The pistol is resting on his lap. He turns to face us again and holds his two hands out with palms facing each other. Iran, he says, holding his head, nodding his head toward one hand. America, he says, lifting the other. Problem, he says, stretching out the distance between them. He checks our faces to make sure his message registered, then drops his arms. Sarah turns to me and starts. What does she see? Her eyes are penetrating. Do you think he's going to hurt us? She asks. I don't know whether to respond or just stare at her. I'm terrified. We walk into our fear together, letting it surround us softly like a fog. The immediate prospect of death seems so different than I had imagined it. In my mind, I see us pulling over to the side of the road and leaving the car quietly. My tremulous legs will convey me mechanically over the rocky earth. I will be holding Sarah's hand and maybe Josh's too, but I will be mostly gone already walking flesh with no spirit. We won't kiss passionately in our final moments before the trigger pull. We won't scream. We won't run. We won't utter fabulous words of defiance as we stare down the gun barrel. We will be like mice, paralyzed by fear, limp in the slack jaw of a cat. We will just stand there. Each of us will fall, one by one, hitting the gravelly earth with a thud. So we were taken... We weren't taken out of the car... Uh, in the middle of the countryside, we were taken to a jail, an uh, empty jailhouse, and we were held there for a few days. And then we were driven across the country to Tehran, and we were blindfolded and put in a van and brought to uh, Avin prison. We didn't know we were in Avin prison for several months, but um, we were all separated immediately. We were in solitary cells, and for two months we were interrogated. And uh, that time in solitary confinement was... Um, a time when I watched my mind slow down, uh, where I felt like I was becoming kind of more of an animal and uh, wasn't thinking because I didn't have much to reflect back to myself. I, I hoped for the interrogators to come every day so I had someone to talk to. Um, I would steal leaves from outside and hide them in my room so I could smell them and have some connection to the outside. And, and I thought about escaping a lot. And, uh, you know, I, there was a lock up on the window, and I thought maybe I could take something from the back of the toilet and pick the lock with that. And, or one time a guard gave me razor blades, and I thought maybe I could keep one of those razor blades and, and use it to get out. Um, but one day, a guard left the slot of my door open, and I reached through it, and I felt the key in my door. So it was late, and I waited, you know, for a long time. I opened the door, peeked out. And I, didn't, I saw a guard sitting down there, so I waited until late at night. And when I didn't hear anybody anymore, I reached through and opened the door and came out. And I went across the hall to another cell, and I opened the door of that cell, which was Sarah's cell. And um, I, we hadn't seen each other for a few, few weeks, and we, we spent about 20 to 30 minutes together, and uh, I won't go into the details of what happened because I'm not as, I'm a little more shy speaking than I'm writing, <laughs> but 
the next morning.